top, and again, we're adding layer by layer by layer here on top of this uh, succession. Then we find the Mississippian rocks. There's a term you recognize in terms of the geologic period. Named not after the state, but after the river. In fact, it's named after the area of the Mississippi River where Illinois, Iowa, and, and Missouri come together. Around St. Louis and, and north of there is where uh, the term Mississippian comes from. And of course, in the Grand Canyon, it's the Great Red Wall. Uh, you spend an hour or two hiking out of the river, and you think, oh, I'm doing pretty good. And you get up on the trail, and meanwhile, the temperature's gone up to about 105 degrees. And you look at this big red cliff, and you say, oh, my goodness, how am I going to get past that? Uh, of course, here we're on the river, but when you're on the trails in the central part of the park, uh, it's an imposing cliff, 600 feet of almost pure limestone. Uh, in many cases, the famous Daisy's Paradise here, where the water literally just pours right out of the out of the caves in the port's uh, limestone. Uh, very again, clear, warm, shallow seas. Here it is in the Bree Canyon along the Bree Railroad, and another shot here in in Grand Canyon. This this incredible cliff of nearly pure limestone, and. Uh, uh, again, one of the most marvelous seas of, of all geologic time because it was so pure and clear and, and it spread across all of uh, western and south central and, and even into southeastern uh, uh, United States and up into Canada. Uh, most of the famous caves are in, are in the Mississippian rocks. Of course, there's hundreds and hundreds of caves in, in Grand Canyon uh, and in parts of Colorado and, and so forth. And then when you get into the into the St. Louis area, the, the caves of uh, Mark Twain and, uh, uh, are in uh, Mississippi limestone. Uh, Mammoth Cave is in the, the same limestone. It has different names there. And again, this is not meant to be confusing, but geologists studying in this area named this limestone, the Red Wall limestone, after the big red wall in Grand Canyon. And over here, they named it the Leadville limestone after the mining town of Leadville. And uh, that's just the way it goes. That's <laughs> I can't apologize for all these names. I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> and then on top of the uh, Mississippian, we get Pennsylvania rocks. Again, another term that you'll recognize, actually named after the state of Pennsylvania, particularly the area around Pittsburgh and the, uh, the Allegheny country and so forth is where the term comes from. Well, in Grand Canyon and most of the Colorado Plateau, these are very colorful rocks. Uh, in reds and browns and tans and so forth. Uh, here we see uh, the, the Supai group, the Pennsylvanian part of the Supai group in the Grand Canyon. Uh, here we see it along the Burry Railroad. Um, and here we see it on the famous goose next to the San Juan in, in southern Utah. By this time, the, the continents which, had dis which I showed you dispersing in the Cambrian had now come back together in the uh, Pennsylvania to form the supercontinent Pangaea, Pangaea literally meaning all the land. And so when, when the two largest components collided, Gondwana to the south and Laurasia to the north, they formed what must have been uh, perhaps the greatest mountain chain ever to, to, to be on planet Earth. In our country, of course, we call it the Appalachian uh, Mountains that stretched all the way from west, uh, a little bit later anyway, all the way from west Texas, all the way up through the Ural chain up into, up into uh, Asia. So an incredible chain of mountains as these continents came together and collided. Again, our part of the world indicated by the, by the arrowhead. Well, the deposition, uh, we talked about several periods of, of clear, limey seas. Well, that came to an abrupt end in the, in the Pennsylvania when some mountains were uplifted not only in Colorado, but of course the Appalachians, which are off the, off the map here. Uh, a lot of sediment was supplied uh, into the, uh, what had been shallow seas, and it made them very sandy and muddy. And in fact, in many cases, uh, across the landscape, windblown dunes or aeolian sand dunes marched across. And we see these in, in Grand Canyon in a unit called the Manicachau Formation, which is part of the part of the Subai group. Um, so very complicated landscapes uh, uh, developed towards uh, you know, in the Pennsylvanian and into the ensuing Permian. And here's another example of a Pennsylvanian landscape in the late Pennsylvanian. 
shallow seas. And by the way, it was very arid at this period of time in the southwest. And there's a lot of salt in here. If you've ever seen the, the uh, if you've ever been up at Dead Horse Point, uh, look down, you see those, those salt evaporator pits outside of Moab there. They're getting salt from these, these rocks here. So the seas were very, very evaporatic, and a tremendous amounts of salt actually form part of the rock record. Again, in our part of the world, mostly dunes and, and, and arid, uh, arid river systems and shallow seas to the south and down around Tucson. The Permian, uh, I like to say, uh, without, I don't think exaggerating too much, that the Permian section in northern Arizona is, is one of the finest Permian sections anywhere on planet Earth, uh, both in Grand Canyon, places like Canyon de Shea, in the Valley, and down around Sedona. These are all Permian rocks exposed, uh, very red in color for the most part, giving brilliant landscapes, uh, forming various national parks and monuments and so forth. So again, this complicated period of sedimentation that had started in the Pennsylvania continued into the Permian, uh, depositing these colorful uh, rocks in a variety of different uh, uh, landscapes. In fact, if you look carefully, this picture of Canyon de Shea, you can actually see the large cross beds here formed by aeolian dunes, wind-blown dunes that were marching southward across northeastern Arizona during the, during the Permian. And uh, a series of, of different environments ensued as the dunes would march across the landscape, the seas would come back in, the dunes would take over. A constant battle between these different environments uh, related to sea level and so forth. And you might say, well, you know, why was planet Earth so nervous here? Why was it bouncing around? Well, from uh, I think the easiest explanation for this, besides all the mountain building that I've already talked about, is uh, a, a, a really an, um, uh, important event was taking place in the Southern Hemisphere. Basically, um, Australia, um, India, and uh, Antarctica were nestled uh, around the South Pole. And during this period of time, huge glaciers would form. Well, what does a glacier do? A glacier takes water out of the Earth's hydrologic system, and it stores it as solid ice. Well, that takes water out of the ocean. So you form the, the, ice, the, the glaciers, sea level falls. You melt the glaciers and sea level rises. And there are places in, in both North America and in parts of uh, Asia and Europe and so forth where they can count 50 or 60 of these cycles. For a comparison, during the ice ages of the Pleistocene the era, that we, or the, the period that we just, uh, we just left a few thousand years ago, they'd identified 13 glacial cycles. So uh, uh, 50 or 60 or 70 more cycles during the Pennsylvanian and the Permian. And so sea level was moving up and down and up and down and up and down. The river formation, uh, mostly river deposits, uh, arid river systems. Uh, we find lots of evidence for, for rivers that dried up and, and left their rock record uh, across much of the Colorado Plateau. Again, you see this plethora of names depending on just where where you are. It's the Hermit across most of Arizona and other names elsewhere. Then uh, another series of events took place and particularly centered around eastern Arizona here. Part of the Earth's crust uh, subsided fairly rapidly and allowed the sea to come into eastern Arizona like so. And Along the edge of the sea was a series of sand dunes, and again, remember, sea level is fluctuating. It's, it's popping up and down, perhaps every two or three hundred thousand years. That's that's about the, the cycle of these glaciations, um, something like that. And so the sea level would, would 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 lower, and the sand dunes would march across the area. Then the sea would come back in, back out, back in, back out. Around Sedona and the Shinobi Hill Formation, I've counted about 30 or 40 of these cycles. Now, not every one of these is a major change in sea level, but it shows the shifting back and forth. And actually, just from your car, you can actually count these things. When you look at the rocks of just above Sedona, you notice the striping, the oranger and the, and the redder and then the, the pale uh, tan rocks and so forth. Those represent the changing of environments uh, in this formation 
during the Permian across the Sedona area. 